Oh. That might have been a sign for us. Stop talking. Oh, it's so good to be back. We had a great trip, but it's always nice to come back home. This morning, as we lift up our voices in worship and praise, we are starting with a victory chant. And so as you all stand and sing, I'm going to ask that the men join me in singing the lead, and then the women will echo. Okay? So please stand with us. of you who were in here before service, you might have noticed that our announcements are now being scrolled. <laughs> and those will also be at the end. So as a reminder of something that you think, oh, I need to put that in my calendar, it'll be there at the end as well. Therefore, oh, and you also have printed bulletins. Therefore, we're going to skip, you know, the norms. So we're just going to go right to our call to worship this morning. Uh, Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say in view of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how shall we not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? It is Messiah who died and moreover was raised and is now at the right hand of God and who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as the sheep, of, as the sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. And Miss Kathy's going to lead us in prayer. Would you all pray with me, please? Dearest Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, to give you all our praise, to lift your name high as our, our true God, the one and only God, the creator of all things in this universe. Father God, we do 
ask that you be with us today, that you open our hearts and our minds to your word. We ask that you be with Bill as he delivers your word to us. Father God, be with those who are needing your healing touch today. We ask that if it be your will, you would heal them, comfort those who need your comfort, and be with those who are homeless that need somewhere to stay and provide their needs, Father. Help us to be a light in your world in everything we do and everything we say. Commit our hearts to you, Father, and to your words. And Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us every day. Thank you for your church. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to stand with us again.
Good morning. Have you been redeemed by the grace of the Lamb? That's just amazing words that were put to music. So, so many times we, we talk about our walks with the Lord. But when was the last time that you actually sat down and ate a meal with Him? You know, as we come to this time, we will be preparing to have this meal. Um, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that when we partake of the bread and of the cup, we fellowship with our Savior. We participate in this fellowship. So when we come to this table, Jesus is here. His spirit is with us. We're not re re merely remembering Jesus when we come to this table. We are eating this meal with him. He has asked us to do this every time we join together. So he's present by the spirit. As we eat and as we drink, we eat and drink with him. We renew ourselves spiritually through Jesus Christ. God invites us to this meal. So this is a participation that we use. This, this is the, the same word that is used in 1 Corinthians, that this is the first time in the letter. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is our Savior. We are to be in intimacy with Christ when we come here. We need to examine ourselves when we come here. Because God gave us his son to allow us to join together in this time. He meets with us. He walks among us. The blood of Christ is where we can get the fellowship. This communion is a holy moment. And we not only acknowledge our sins and our unworthiness, but then we also fellowship with Jesus. But we need to come here acknowledging our issues, our sins that Christ took to the cross for us. In this holy meal, we also recognize that there is one body, the bread. And we who are many are one in this body and we will partake, partake of this one bread. This is a family meal. Christ has taken us all in. He took each and every one of us in when he went to the cross. All our diversities and all of our stories and all of our sinfulness and all of our sufferings because there is only one true bread from heaven. All who believe in him are one body eating and drinking spiritually from one great shared hope. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, as we prepare for this time, most of the men have already come forward, and I appreciate that. But what a privilege that we need to focus on this fellowship as this family, this one, the unity in this meal. This privilege keeps us united and pressing on in holiness. This privilege provides empowering grace to help us fight sin so that we won't mix fellowship with Christ and fellowship with sin. This is a meal to help us fix our eyes on Jesus and link arms as a family as we walk forward together towards eternal glory and the strength that he supplies. Only he can supply it. So when we do finally arrive home, we will feast together again with Christ. We will be joining in the wedding supper of the Lamb, free from sin, in the presence of Jesus, where there is fullness of joy and fellowship forevermore. So as we come here, remember this. You are bought by his blood. 
You were purchased to be redeemed. So we should be eager to receive all the grace that Jesus Christ is offering to us when we join together with this meal. I'm going to ask that we pray, and then the men will pass out the, the emblems, and we'll hold them and partake together as one family. Our Father and our God in heaven, Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace, Father, that uh, you sent your one and only Son, Father, to willingly take our sins, our ugliness, to the cross. Father, we just pray that as we prepare to take this meal, that we will focus upon what Jesus has done for us, the sacrifice that was made, the beating that was taken, the blood that was poured out. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this time to come together and join in this meal as the family of Christ. For we were purchased by the blood, and it is in Jesus' most precious and holy name that we thank you and that we pray. Amen. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, 
also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Kid City, you are dismissed. Reading from John 1, verses 35 through 37. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. From the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Dropping down to verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at, at, at Jesus as he walked, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. These brief statements by John the Baptist summarize mankind's desperate need and God's gracious answer.
the idea of the Lamb. Rooted in Old Testament imagery and practice, there was the Passover Lamb. From the time of the Exodus, when the ten plagues had befallen, the tenth plague being the death of the firstborn, and God had the Hebrew people slaughter a lamb, each household, and paint the doorposts with the blood, and the angel of death would pass over, not bringing death, and they were delivered. In the land of Israel, the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices, two lambs a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. The Day of Atonement still appears in our calendars, Yom Kippur. When a bull was offered for the sins of the high priest so that he could then stand before God and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And he had two lambs or two goats. And one would be slaughtered on the altar and the other he would put his hands upon it, transferring symbolically the sins of the people to this poor animal who was then led off into the wilderness where it would probably be devoured by wild animals. You probably know this, but just as a side note, this is the book of Leviticus. What was that second goat called? That was the scapegoat. We still use that phrase today, don't we? Sacrifice. And when John saw Jesus, he told those who were within earshot, Behold, look, fix your gaze upon this one. He is God's Lamb. And he takes away the sin of the world. I want to talk about reality today. A lot of people in our culture dismiss truth, dismiss reality, create their own illusion. For those of you who are moviegoers, much of our culture seems to live within the matrix, oblivious to what is true. So three things I want to set before you this morning. The first one is this, we need to get real. Has anyone ever told you that <laughs> when you were being a little bit of a dullard, a little dense, a little obtuse? Any other words I can throw in there for that one? Get real, and by this I simply mean this, be honest about your sin. Be honest about your sin. Now I grant that there are some people who unfortunately are beset with a terrible amount of self-loathing. They have a hard time seeing anything good in themselves, even with the work of Christ upon them. But it seems that we have a cultural shift, not just the society of the world, but even a societal shift within the church, where sin has been so greatly downplayed that, well, we're just not honest about our sin anymore. We, we downplay it. We ignore it. We even deny its reality. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans chapter 1, spoke a little bit about this attitude. Beginning in verse 28, he'll say this, Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Whew, that's a mouthful. And, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. 
In many of Paul's letters, he does these little sin lists. They're not very pretty. Even in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, most of us know we get down to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and we recite the what? The fruit of the Spirit. But Galatians chapter 5 begins with the life of the flesh, and Paul identifies a whole boatload of sins, and he says, this is the way of the flesh, this is the way of life apart from the Spirit of God, and then he contrasts that with the Spirit of God. Maybe in VBS we need to learn the sin list as well as the fruit of the Spirit to know what needs to be avoided, what we are what redeemed from. But Paul goes on in that Romans chapter 1 text after giving the sin list, he says there are those, and maybe he's speaking of culture, maybe he's speaking of the church, we, we don't really know, but he says they know what God says. They know that God identifies these things as wicked. They know that under God's judgment, these things bring death. And that's eternal death. That's, that's damnation. They know that this brings death. But they do two things. They join in the practice, they themselves. They just say, oh, this looks fun. Or this is who I am. Or this is what I choose to be. This is what I choose to do. Not God's will, but mine be done. They join in. They practice these things. And the second thing they do is they give hearty approval to those who practice them. I think we in the church have for so long had people point fingers at us and call us judgmental that we've ceased to speak truth. We're so afraid for our own egos, I guess, or our own reputations that we maybe adopt the things which lead to death in our own lives. And maybe we give hearty approval to those who practice them. All I'm saying is this, we need to get real. We need to be honest about our sin. It's sometimes easy for us to point our fingers at the world and say, look at all those people. Look at the fornicators. Look at the adulterers. Look at the LBGB, I can't do them all out there. All the alphabet soup people. Look at the liars and look at the politicians. And on and on and on we go. How about we look at ourselves? How about I take a time and look in a spiritual mirror? How about I pray that Old Testament prayer that says, examine me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me, in me, so that I might be brought to repentance. Now, here's the reality. You guys know the text. It's in the book of Romans, and Paul says, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If any of you sit there and you think, wait a minute, I'm a good person. Let me give you the truth, the true reality. No, you're not. Just offended most of you, didn't I? I'm not like the guy down the street who beats his wife and kicks his dog. I'm not like the, the businessman who swindled people out of millions of dollars. I'm not like the, 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 the woman who, who, who abandoned her children. I'm not like, wait a minute, what are we not doing in this moment? We're being honest about my sins, our own sins your sins, not the neighbor. And when we begin to realize that all sin and fall short of the glory of God, you, do, you, do you realize it only takes one? You, you, you've lived 80 years, and oh goodness, when you were eight years old, you went into Starkey's Market, and you walked out with that mounds bar. That's personal confession, by the way. Mom sent me back to pay for it. So I guess that's retro repentance or something. I don't know. But I never did anything else wrong, which that would be a lie, so I'm not going to tell you I've never done anything else wrong. 
But that one causes me, what, to fall short of the glory of God and to come under his judgment. And there's nothing I can do to remedy that. Nothing. I need, you need, we need a sacrificial lamb. We need 